All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, as you're standing, before you stand, if we were to do popcorn preaching tonight, how many popcorns do I have? Would you stand up? Popcorn preaching, one in the balcony, two in the balcony, three, four. I think we'll do popcorn tonight. Maybe some of you will get right with God between now and then. <laughs> All right, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. If my voice comes back, then I'll put you all on hold. But we haven't done that in quite a while. And it's a, it's a good thing. It's a lot of fun. I'll give you about five to seven minutes or so and give you a subject and let you have at it. And uh, that'll, that'll be a something we haven't done in a while, but it'll be a real blessing, I think. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, and get in one hand, and then get Romans chapter number 8 in the other hand. Just back up to just a couple of books there to Romans chapter number 8. I'm going to set the precedent for where we're headed tonight, or this morning, and give you just a couple of things to think about. It's a mindset in modern Christianity is, is that now that I'm saved, then the troubles are a thing of the past. Of course, you've been saved long enough now, most of you, to know that's not true. But sometimes being reminded of that becomes imperative. Uh, because God's been good to us sometimes for a long period of time, and we get to thinking, okay, it's smooth sailing. And then before long, there's dark clouds on the horizon, and things are not going. The wind begins to kick up just a little bit, and the waves begin to tumble one over the other. And then before long, we find ourselves in the midst of a storm, and don't even realize why we're in the midst of the storm. We haven't really done anything wrong. So Paul says this in verse or chapter number 4, verse number 8, 2 Corinthians, We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus and life also of Jesus Christ might be made manifest in our body. So do you see the trouble there? Paul's saying people are watching you while you're in trouble and that it's being manifest. Your relationship with the Lord is being manifest while you're in a physical body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We have the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. We also believe, and therefore we speak. All right, Romans chapter number 8. Come down to verse number 35. 8 is the passage that we talk about. and We know all things work together for good. You know that. Come down to verse number 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Brother Larry, you pray, would you please, and ask the Lord to help us. It preached to us and us be able to hear. Thank you, Lord, for that liberty, that freedom, uh, Lord, and everything that goes with it. Those that protect us daily, even hourly, Lord, that that's possible. Thank you, Lord, for the song this morning, the songs that were sung. And uh, we're, we were thanking, Lord, the message in the song that we get uh, is only because of you, Lord. You yes. quickened us. Right. Right. The power, your power on us, God, us being alive in you being saved by the grace of God is the reason we can hear the message, Lord. So we thank you for that. And yet further, Lord, the message the preacher is going to give us, God, that you've given him. I pray for him, Lord, as he delivers it. I pray it may have free course to come and, and to do and to, uh, to be used in our life. And thank you for that message in advance, yes. what, we have, how we have, uh, what we have coming forth, Lord, from him. Thank you for using him. 
And I pray you would lift him up, Lord, in the, in, the, in the body of us, Lord, this morning, Lord, Lord, to strengthen him that he might be able to preach and uh, give us that good word. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Thank you. As you're being seated, before we go to my main text for today, I'd like to simply say this to you. You look at your real position there in verse number 36. Very few people recognize Excuse me, that even though I am a sheep, there is a purpose of that sheep. That Bible says that the sheep is there and it's accounted as a sheep for the slaughter, meaning that my life is hidden in Christ, but that he can do with me whatever he chooses to do for me. And the greatest witness or testimony that we ever had of Christianity is Jesus Christ and him crucified. You have to recognize that when Jesus Christ came, they wrapped him in swaddling clothes and they lied him, or laid him into a manger. And that swaddling clothes is like grave clothes. And they put him there because his purpose of coming was ultimately to die. He knew that when he came down here. His purpose of living his life was to set him up as a testimony for those of us that are Christians nowadays. Most times what we don't recognize is, is that now that we're saved, our life is supposed to be hidden in Christ, but it's also supposed to be a testimony for Christ. And there is no better testimony then when we go through trouble and trials and problems and difficulties, not that we're different than anyone else, but the way we handle it is to be different than anybody else. Why, even the Apostle Paul, when Apostle Paul's talking about death and talking about being absent from the body and present with the Lord, the Apostle Paul said, we sorrow, but not as others that have no hope. That doesn't mean that you lose a loved one, as was mentioned. Both of the songs had that sort of a, a thread in there of trying to make sense of suffering, trying to make sense of trouble, trying to make sense of trials. I will say this in my own personal life. When trouble comes my way, it tends to do two things. Number one, it tends to knock off my sin. And number, ten, it, number two, it tends to draw me closer to him. I tend to spend more time in prayer and more importantly, I tend to talk to him about things that really matter, not just about getting well. It has a tendency to narrow my focus down. Uh, sometimes I don't recognize that I might not be the witness that I ought to be. And God allowed trouble to come into my personal life and in your life too for the benefit of giving you a chance to witness to minister to other people. Most people that pray and ask for an opportunity to witness in your mind what you're thinking is, I want an opportunity to present the four spiritual laws or present the Romans road or to give them the gospel, the plan of salvation. Most of us, when we think about witnessing, ladies and gentlemen, we're not thinking about witnessing the way the Lord witnessed. How did the Lord witness? He hung naked on a cross. Yeah. He said, not my will, but thine be done. He said, lay not this sin to their charge, Lord. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Who would have ever thought that the greatest witness, the greatest testimony, wasn't in the miracles that Jesus performed. It was in the death and the way that he died. Many people, hundreds, thousands of people had died on a cross. Nobody died like Jesus. Nobody died without gritting his teeth and being mad and being angry and cursing the people that were whipping him, cursing the people that were spitting on him, cursing the people plucking out his beard, cursing the people stripping him naked, cursing the people driving nails into his hands and his legs and making him writhe up there like a serpent, banging back and forth on that cross. Nobody ever suffered and died the way he suffered and died. I mean, if anybody should have been upset and should have been uh, giving them what to, it would have been him. You know what he did? He looked down in spite of all that and he said father forgive them man what a testimony why if you got saved you know where you had to come to get saved you had to come to that cross you had to look at a suffering bleeding dying Jesus who died for the sins of the entire world simply because he went through a storm in life so you and I could have peace in our life but the peace in our life, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't always come with everything going well. I mean, if we're going to make a trial a blessing, who would have ever thought that being uh, uh, having your child taken from you at an early age could be a blessing? Lord says it can be. I mean, if anybody's life was cut short, his was cut short. I remember the old preacher talking about a man who had lost his son one time and just thought about this when he was up here singing. We've had other people in here that have lost children also. And the man came to the preacher one time. He was visiting there with him in his living room and they're drinking some coffee and spending some time in a conversation there. And finally the man put his coffee cup down and he said, well, I'd just like to know one thing. Where was God when my son died? 
And the preacher, without even missing a beat, he said the same place he was when his died. We forget about that sometimes. We forget that God manifests in the flesh is watching his son as all man and listens to his son say, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? I mean, you forget about that. Boy, I'm going to tell you what, I think when Pilate sees the Lord come out there, come to Matthew chapter 14 while I'm talking, if you'd please, I think when the Lord looks up there, Pilate looks out, they have beaten the Lord to within an inch of his life. And when Pilate sees that, you know what I think he does when he says, behold the man, I think he's astonished. Yes. I think he is awe-stricken. You know what I think he's awe-stricken by? I don't think he's awe-stricken by just the fact that the man's been beaten within, within an inch of his life and he's got ribbons of flesh hanging off of him and blood and saliva running together with mucus and things there and a pool of that stuff there and his garment is just tattered and torn. I mean, Pilate would have seen war before. He would have seen battles before. But he would have never seen the attitude of the man being beaten the way that he saw it in Jesus Christ. He didn't see a snarl snarling, angry face. He didn't see a face wanting retribution or wanting to be able to have his day in court. He didn't see somebody who wanted vengeance. I think he saw eyes like the eyes of a dove and he saw a face full of peace and he said, oh, it ain't nothing, man. That's what sinners do. That's how people treat somebody that's here to die for him. That's how people treat people that love him. I think when Pilate looked at him and said, behold the man, he said, I've never seen a man like that before. I've never seen a man endure such pain and such agony. And then they come to him and they say, Pilate, you know, up over the top of his head, say, this is the king of the Jews. We need you to change that. And Pilate said, no, buddy, what I wrote, I wrote and I ain't changing it. I've never seen anybody that took that, what he took and did what he did. And I'm telling you right now, I'm washing my hands off because I've never seen a man like that. Now, that's the example. That's the illustration of what the Lord does. Did you ever pause to think about it for a moment that when God allows trouble to come in your life, that he's actually doing you a favor? Have you ever seen it as a gift before? Why the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, he said, if we suffer, we shall also reign. Yes, he says the same thing in Romans chapter number 8. He said that we'll be heirs of Christ if so be that we suffer. Romans 8, that's 16, 17 right in there. So if that's the case, when God sends a trial your way, you know what he's doing? He's sending you a gift. I mean, most of us consider a gift to be something monetary or something that you know, we consider it a gift if we get well. We consider it a gift if we get what it is that we want that makes our life more convenient, easier, simpler. It's one of those things that makes it a, a, without any troubles or trials or difficulties. Did you ever consider that God, when he gives you trouble, he's given you the greatest gift he could give you? We're always looking real hard to find that peaceful spot, that sweet spot where everything is just going well and everything's going smooth. You know what I've learned? Maybe this isn't true of you. I find if life is too smooth, you have a tendency to forget God. I find when the towers fall, people flock to church. I find when the Pentagon gets bombed, people come to church. I find when war breaks out, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, I find people come to church. I find out when there's a threat of going to be some kind of a bomb or something taking people come to church. COVID comes and people don't come to church no more. Don't you realize or recognize the importance that that trouble came in as an opportunity maybe for Christians to say, hey, listen, God's as much in that as he has been in war. And I'm not going to forsake the Lord during a time like this where I'm uncertain why you were even scared to come together with each other. Yet the Bible said, forsake not the assembly yourselves together even more so such as you see the day approaching. You say, what is it? It's a testimony to the rest of the world out there. Why? God's not dead. Amen. I don't care what Nietzsche and everybody else tried to teach that God was dead and God's not around. You can't look at the foolishness going on in this world today and the fact that you still enjoy some of the freedoms that you enjoy and say there is no God. Amen. I mean, I'm going to tell you what, if there wasn't any God restraining, holding things back from the wickedness, you'd be over, you wouldn't have, you'd have call out the whole military. You wouldn't have enough to stem this tide of wickedness. You say, what is it that holds them back? A good police department, a good military, a good, no, it's God holding it back. God's preventing them from crossing over that line. You say, what? He's looking out for you right now. If he didn't, there's no lock strong enough to be able to hold them. And that day's coming, and it'd be like the days of Noah, if that's correct, that there's only eight people that are saved in the days of Noah. You know what that means, ladies and gentlemen? That means that if God doesn't restrain wickedness, it'll take all but just a few. And then that rapture will take place, and boy, it'll be hail Columbia after that. 
You say, what is it? God's given you an opportunity to be a witness. Paul says, y'all looking at us and worry about us. He's answering a prayer for me. Paul says in Colossians 1, I said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, I mean, you know what? I want to go out with a few cut marks. I want to go out with a few boot Amen. prints in the back of my back. I want to go out with a few skin nose and uh, skin knees and busted yes. noses. I want to go out for the right reason, for the right reason. Yes. And God gives us an opportunity to do that, whether it's in a hospital setting or whether it's in your home, whether it's at work, whatever. You forgot you're bought with a price. Yes. And I think that the way we oftentimes embrace those things is we don't realize God's the one that put us in the boat that allowed us the opportunity to take us where we wouldn't normally go. Matthew chapter number 14, if you're there, and I'm just going to recall a, a story to you while I'm getting there. In Matthew or Mark chapter number 4, uh, there's uh, some ships going over there to a little island. And uh, while they're there, the Bible says the apostles were in that boat and there were other little ships with them. Do you remember, excuse me, do you remember that? Yes. And there were other little ships with them. And the Lord was in the ship with the apostles in Mark chapter number 4. And a storm came. Now, I mean, pause and think about it for a minute. Wouldn't you think of all the people that shouldn't be in a storm, it would be the Lord, the creator of the storms. And yet he's in the boat and he's asleep on a pile of fish in the back or however you want to draw the picture up. And the Lord's in that situation there and all of a sudden the storms come up and the apostles come out there and Lord cares not that we perish. You know what the Lord's response is to that? His initial response. Where's your faith? But you see it wasn't in faith that the Lord could calm the storm. It's where's your faith that you didn't think this storm came up to help you to be a testimony to all these other little ships out here. And there's a devil possessed man that's up in the crags of those rocks up there. And he's watching what y'all are doing up there. And he's got some severe problems. He's devil possessed. He's got over a thousand devils in him. And I'm letting this storm be an illustration to him so that when we finally get there, he'll be receptive because I'm going to do something out here in this storm that'll prepare him for what I'm going to do for the storm in his life. Yes, did. <laughs> Where is your faith? What faith, Lord? I mean, why did the storm happen? Why are we in the trouble that we're in? Why are we having the problems? The Lord said, because we're headed over here and I need the storm to blow me over here. But I need you to recognize all these little ships are watching you. That's like Grandma Holland used to say all the time, watching you, watching you. Forgive my voice, there's an all seeing eye watching you. Yeah, but there's more than just him watching. When you get right with the Lord Jesus Christ, you'd be surprised. You don't have to worry about him watching you and catching you doing bad. You know what you start worrying about? Lord, am I a good testimony? Lord, am I doing good? Lord, have I been a good witness to other people? Lord, are you proud of me? I I'm, I'm doing good, Lord. I'm doing good. See, you take selfishness out of it. Like the old preacher used to say about his uh, daughter went out there and got ink on her dress and then she tried to wash it out and she just made a mess of her dress and that kind of a thing. And he had to get on her dingbat there and straighten her out for playing around with the ink pen she wasn't supposed to play around with. And he said the next day he got ready to leave for work and he pulled out there and his daughter's out there and she's got on a, a clean dress now and all that kind of stuff. And she's holding up her hands that have had the ink washed off of them. I'm being good, daddy. I'm being good, daddy, she says. You see, it's not always just about I'm being good. It's, Lord, I'm, I'm being good. I'm being good. But what about a witness to other people? Yes. What about the ones that aren't as fortunate as you and I? What about the ones that aren't going to heaven? What about the ones that don't have a King James Bible? What about the ones that don't know how to rightly divide the Bible? What about the ones that don't have access to the throne room because of the mediator, God and man, the man Christ Jesus? What about the ones that can't even get past the front door because they're not saved? What about the lost and dying on their way to hell? What about the people that don't have a church to come to? What about those people? You say, what draws them? You people when you go through trouble. It does a whole lot more for people and becomes a whole lot more real than when you run your mouth. I mean, talk's cheap, as they say. But boy, when they see you go through it and you're still doing what God would have you to do, you know what they say? My goodness, what is it you got? What's different about you? 
I hate to say this, sometimes you have to get old in life to be able to have that kind of a testimony. But God's got a plan for where he's taking you. You remember over there in the book of Acts, you remember the apostle Paul, he's getting ready to go down there to, uh, the, the, uh, the, it wasn't commodious for them to go because the, the uh, wind wasn't blowing the right way. And Paul said, you shouldn't go, we should just winter right here. And they said, no, soft wind blowed. And they decided they'd go ahead and go. And they wind up in a storm. They wind up in that storm for something like 14 days. And Paul comes out from the hole of that ship down there out of the bottom. And he said, be of good cheer. Uh, be not afraid. God's with us. Amen. Where's Paul been? Down the hole of the ship praying. Amen. Where's that ship going? It's going over to the island of Miletus where there's a fellow over there who's got a sick uh, son that's there and an entire village that needs to be saved. That ship gets blown completely off course. Why? The Lord didn't want him to winter over there. The Lord wanted to winter him in the other place. That ship comes apart. They swim over there to the shore. And as soon as Paul steps onto that shore, you know what happens to the Apostle Paul? You got to get this before I get where I'm going. You see what happens? He's all he's doing is gathering sticks to try to put on the fire to warm other people up. Sticks look like a stick and he was asleep. And buddy, when you heat up people that are asleep, there's a good way to get bit, man. That thing latches onto him like that. And the apostle Paul looked at that thing for a second like that and said, man, you're doing me a favor. Sink your teeth in. Boy, I'm ready to go. I have some of the body present with the Lord, man. I'm now ready to be offered. Boy, I mean, henceforth laid at me a crown. And the Lord said, you're a little out of your dispensation there, Paul. Paul, shake that thing off. And he says, Lord, I'd just soon leave him on here for a little while longer. I mean, because I'll get to go ahead and come see you. Paul, everybody ain't been to heaven like you've been to heaven. Shake that thing off. And, and Paul was, but when I was up there, whether in the body of the body, I cannot tell. But, but you know, Lord. And that kind of, the Lord said, you better get rid of that thing, boy. And Paul shakes that thing off like that. And they all, you know what the Bible says? They all watched him. And they said, he's a murderer. There's no way. You say, why? He got bit by the snake. Well, he's going to be dead now. And Paul comes, he puts a load of wood out there like that, and they keep watching him. He comes and puts another load, and they said, man, what's going on with that guy? And Paul said, it had nothing to do with me. It has to do with the God I serve. Yeah. And before long, you know what happens? They're watching a man. And Paul said, yeah, I'm a murderer. Sure, I used to kill people in the name of Jesus. He said, but I, then I met the real Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he sat down around that crackling fire with that little misty rain's coming down. That north wind is blowing, man. And they're all huddled in there together. And Paul said, man, I never thought I'd have a congregation like this. And all he does is just give his testimony. And those people, I mean, one by one, they drop like flies, boy. They just drop like flies. And they're getting saved and they're getting saved and they're getting saved. And Paul said, my goodness, all this for a snake bite? And the Lord said, yep. I brought you around here and put you in the wet sand from a sinking ship over there and have a snake bite you in order to have people watch you, Paul. We're down in a prison not far from here one day. We're down there, didn't expect a whole lot. They jammed us in a room that, you know, intentionally were trying to mess us up. They were jammed in there like cordwood, man. I mean, piled all around that place, table shoved over in the corner, sitting up on the table, sitting down in chairs. And the preacher gets up there and he's beginning to draw those uh, the men on the cross there, Jesus in the middle and the two boys on either side. And he gets up there and he gets to preaching. And it's hot, boy. I mean, it's blazing hot. They turn the air conditioning off there. Just a bunch of sweaty men in there, convicts in there, orange pajamas, shower shoes, and they're sitting there. And it got quiet. Well, you could have heard a pin hit a carpet in there. It was so quiet. Quiet. And he's up there and he presents the plan of salvation. And I'll never forget it, man. It sounded so loud like rifles going off. I mean, they began to fall like you're taking a chainsaw and cutting people, or cutting trees down. Those things crack, then fall. And one by one, you hear that chair slide out and hit that floor. And you hear those old sweaty palms hit that floor. And you got men all over that thing with their hands down like this and their head bowed like that and praying to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And the correct officer comes in and she looks in the window like that. And I just please, you know, like this. And she just backed off and waited. Thank the Lord she didn't hurry to get in to do her count. And I don't remember how many, but nearly everybody in that room asked Jesus Christ to save them that day. You say, what? That's the witness. That's the testimony. That's what the Lord does with trouble. But you can't make sense of it in this life. Paul's out there. You would never think anything of it. Paul's over there and he's shipwrecked now and the ships come apart and he's not fulfilling his quote ministry. The Lord gives him the entire place. He winds up healing the chief's boy and all of that. And after that thing is over with, they put him on a ship and still send him over there for his trial. 
I, if I could paint, I wish I could paint. I'd have the chief of that country come over there and they'd say, tell his uh, grandson, say, hey, remember that shipwreck you saw out there? Yeah, daddy, our granddaddy, I saw that. So listen, they're going to they're going to hang that boy over there and go cut his head off. I'd like for you to meet him before he dies. And they load him up and they get on a ship and they go over there and they come around and the, and the old chief says, you see that man right there? That's the man healed me up right there. That's the Apostle Paul. The God he serves is a real God. My, our whole, you're getting raised as a benefit of him coming by there. You say, why? Well, see, the Lord blew his ship off course and then crashed it on our, nobody would have ever come around there if it hadn't been him. That chief looks up there and the Apostle Paul's coming out. I don't have Paul coming out like this. I have Paul going, finally. Hallelujah, man. About time. I hope they get it right this time, man. I mean, last time they stoned me and drug me out of the city, man. I had an out-of-body experience, man. And then I had to come back in the body. And what a drag that was. Boy, I hope they got it right. I have that chief standing there, if I could paint. I have that chief standing there and say, uh, excuse me, sir. Hey, hey, uh, Paul, excuse, excuse me just for a minute. And the guy said, aren't you a king over there in Miletus and all? He said, yeah. He said, what you doing over here? He said, oh, I came to see a friend of mine. Who, who's your friend? He said, Paul. Paul said, oh, hey, chief, how you doing? How you been feeling? He said, I've been feeling better than I've ever felt before. Well, who's this little fellow here with you? So that's my grandson. I've been, been telling him about you. I wanted him to meet you. I got Paul down there in chains. I got him kneeling down there like this, like that, and sticking his hand out there to that little boy. He said, hey, young man, I met your granddaddy. And granddaddy said, yeah, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea used the apostle Paul and from the waters lifted me. And he said, hey, boy, sure is good to meet you. He said, listen to your granddaddy. He can help you out. He said, well, uh, aren't they fixing to kill you? He said, yeah, are you worried? He said, put your hand right here, son. And the heart's going, dung, 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 dung. And he said, well, I'd be scared to death. He said, you don't know the one I know. The one I know will give you peace beyond all peace and give you an ability to be able. He said, son, you have no idea where it is I'm headed. Man, I've been there before. I'm telling you, I have not seen neither ear heard, neither the heart of man have prepared for him the things that he lo that love him. He said, I'm going to see my Savior. I sure hope granddaddy shows you how to meet him one day. He said, Papa, can I meet him one day? He said, we're going to talk about that. And they take him over there and they get ready to walk him up. And that old executioner stands up there and he says, Paul, he said, uh, it's time for you to go now. And Paul said, good. I've been ready since the road to Damascus. And he gets ready to go up there and maybe he takes off his Timex or something there. And he says, here, you can have this where I'm going. I don't have to worry about time anymore. And he said, I don't have nothing else left, but maybe some parchments and stuff. But you can have that too. I'm, I'm going to meet my Savior. I can't wait to go. I'm going to travel light. I'm traveling light. They get up there and they lay him down. And they say a whole bunch of things like that. And Paul said, you don't need to chain me down. I'm ready to be offered. He said, do me a favor, though. I'd appreciate it if you don't have to hit me more than once. I'd hate to flop around, you know. And the guy said, I'll, I'll make sure, preacher. I sure will. Man, I'm telling you, that old hatchet, that sword, that axe came down. That head rolled off. And before he could hit the basket, it's in heaven with a crown on it. And I think that old executioner's up there saying, preacher, I'm, I'm sure sorry about that. I, I sure am sorry about that. Uh, uh, Lord, if you could forgive me for doing that, I, I'd appreciate it. The Lord said, what? Forgive you for killing a preacher? Forgive you for killing? Yes, sir, Lord, I know you probably can't find it in you to do that. And the Lord said, whosoever will, let him come. Yeah. He said, well, what do, you, what do you think? I think that old centurion soldier takes that hat off of his head there with that old crust on crowd on it and that crown right there. I think he takes his robe off and he covers up the body of the apostle. Oh, preacher, you're just, oh, well, I'm telling the story. You tell it however you want to tell it. <laughs> I think that old centurion says, you know something? I, I remember... Uh, My uncle telling me one time about being there when this man Jesus was crucified. And I remember my uncle was given the responsibility of stabbing him under the fifth rib. And I remember he said that was the son of God. And he said I, he saw blood and water come out. He said, my uncle told me that. He said, that ain't the son of God, but there's something they're akin to right there. The way that man faced death must be like what my uncle was talking about back there. I'm telling you right now, I, I believe in whatever God he had. I've never seen a man. I've killed many a man. I've never seen a man die like that before. And Paul said, it don't have nothing to do with me. It has to do with the one living in me. Yes, sir. We know all things work together for good to them who love God, that them are called according to his purpose. How would you get dispatched? When the time came and the Lord saw fit to have trouble come your way, do you ever thank the Lord for the trouble? 
Do you ever thank the Lord and say, Lord, why would you cease make it such a blessing for me? Why would you give me the privilege of suffering? You say, where do you get that, preacher? That sounds like nonsense. That sounds like masochism or something like that. No, that Bible says that after the Garden of Gethsemane, that Bible says that the, the Lord set his face like a flint for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. You say, what? It's not even up there laughing and clapping and those kind of things. He suffered. Sure enough, he suffered. But never one minute did he gripe or complain. Never one minute did he say to him, I don't deserve this. Never one minute did he do anything other than embrace that thing and be given glory to God Almighty, his Father. You say, why? It's a great gift to be given that. I know what I'm saying. I know what could come my way. I guarantee you right now the fifth cherub that covers is up there in front of the portals of glory saying, you hear that big mouth? You hear him shooting his mouth off? Well, let me have him like I had Job. Let me put him through the ringer. But I'm telling you right now, I know in whom I am believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep me against that day. And you say, well, that, that's what happened. That is what happens, ladies and gentlemen. That's what occurs as a Christian. God is the one that allows you to go through storms in your life. God's the one that puts you in the boat knowing that this time in Matthew 14, you're going to sail into a storm and he ain't going to be in the boat with you. And he's going to see how you handle it. You say, where is he? He's up in the mountain praying. He's watching you. Amen. Bible says watch and pray. Amen. The Lord's up there in Matthew 14. Just follow it. Maybe I'll try to get you out of here early today. But in Matthew 14, you know what the Lord says? This is right after five barley loaves and two fishes. This is right after Herod and Herodias and all that stuff. And John the Baptist is dead there in Matthew 13. You come into 14 there and there be good. you got the death of preaching there in Matthew chapter number 14. This is the one where Pete walks on the water and the Lord gets up there and he feeds those 5,000 men there with the barley loaves and the fishes, which that'd be a great thing to be the lad that he got the lunch from. I mean, could you even skip one meal for Jesus? But that's another story. But at any rate, he comes up there. And after they've seen that miracle, the Lord says, boys, get in that boat right there. Now, y'all go and row to the other side, and I'm going up a part of the mountain to pray. You with me? That's where I'm at. All that other is introduction. That going up in a mountain apart to pray. I'll be praying for you. Okay. They jump in that boat. Would you reckon they're comfortable in that boat? Why, well, sure they are. Peter would be the helmsman of that boat. Peter had a captain. He was a captain of a fleet of boats. He knew about fishing. If anybody was comfortable at all out there on the water, it would have been Peter. I mean, Peter's so comfortable. Later on in John chapter 21, you know what he says to the boys? After he's wound up de deserting the Lord and he's wound up uh, uh, de uh, denying the Lord. You know what he said? Excuse me. You know what he says? He said, I'm going fishing. Why? I'm comfortable in a boat. I like being in a boat. I like uh, having my nets and stuff. I just soon be around those people. I go back to where I'm comfortable. I want to be in that boat. Okay, fine, Pete. You go ahead. They get in that boat and the Lord says, yeah, they all got in there with them and they're rowing. That Bible says, if you read there in the old Schofield, right hand page, left hand column down toward the bottom of the column. It said when they got in the midst of the sea, a storm broke out. You know, that's the most difficult thing when you come into storms. It'll happen right when you're in the middle and you've got a choice whether or not to go ahead and throw the oars in the boat and just let the storm take you wherever you want or keep on rowing and doing what the Lord told you to do, even though you're rowing against trouble. You know what he does? The Bible says, and the Lord looked down there. He's watching and praying. He's down there and he says, you know, Father, I'm just watching to see how the boys do. And I sure am grateful. They're still rowing. The Bible said they're still rowing. He said, now, Father, you just have to cover your ears up. Peter's probably going to let fly here in just a minute. <laughs> He's still, I'm still working on that. He's got that, got that problem with his mouth and all that. But, but at any rate, and the Lord's watching. You so what the Bible says? The Bible says, you look in the passage. He said, they're still rowing. Yes. What do you do when a storm comes your way? What do you do? Just quit? Just throw the oars in the wall. Well, the Lord told me to do this, and the Lord, and the Lord gave me direction, but He didn't prepare me for the storm. Well, He put you in the boat. Right. He knew the storm was coming, didn't He? And the storm came. Well, who would have been the master of the storm? He allowed it anyway. And then all of a sudden, you know what happens? He comes down that mountaintop over there, and the Lord's slow. He's walking on the water. I mean, isn't that how it's been in your life before? You're going through trouble. The Lord ain't running. My Lord don't run. I never seen him run. I mean, he tells me that if I wait on the Lord, I'll walk and I'll, I'll mount up with the wings of eagles and I'll run and not be weary and walk and not be faint. I don't know. I've been faint, more faint walking than running. 
I mean, I'm like, Lord, you hurry up. I mean, like now. You've never been that way before? Y'all, you must be in heaven this morning. Y'all are like, oh, I'm, never, I'm, just, I'm so patient waiting on the Lord, you know, and all that. Not me. I'm like, Lord, I need some help now. I mean, right now, right? And the Lord's... The Bible says that the Lord saw the trouble, the travail that they were in, the problems they were having. You know what the Bible said? And the Lord came walking on the water. You know, one of the saddest things, and I've said it here a multitude of times, but it bears repeating. You know, one of the saddest things is, you read the equivalent of that passage there, the parallel passage. You know what it said? And the Lord would have passed them by. It means they're in the storm. He sees them in the storm. His storm ain't bothering him. He's walking in it. They're in a boat. He's just walking in it. And I say this, he's walking on it. His storm ain't bothering him at all. So much so, the Bible said, he would have passed them by. I like that song that the black folks sing it the best. They call, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Peter's the author of that storm, of that song. You say, oh, no, it's not. Yes, it is. You just don't know. You got to look back in history a little bit to find that. You say, what is that? That's an individual that's in a storm. And instead of all of a sudden the Lord passed by, the Lord said, uh 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 Don't, the boys say, don't pass us by. The Bible said, but one of them cried out. Amen. You mean one out of 12? I mean one out of 12. One out of 12 got the Lord's attention. It had spoke up and guess what? Everybody got the benefit of that one crying out. Don't tell me that God doesn't care when you cry out. Well, I'm the only one crying. Well, maybe the other ones were full of themselves. Maybe the other ones were trying to. I'm not going to call if he don't call. I, I'm not going to do it if he doesn't do it. And I'm not going to. No, no. You know what? I mean, whoever that was, I think it's probably Peter's like, hey, I need some help over here. I need some help. Help me. Let all of them drown. I don't care. Just I don't want to drown. I mean, shoot me a light guard, a ring or something or another. But the Bible said he would have passed them by. See, oftentimes we think when we're in a storm that we don't have to cry out. Maybe God sent the storm just so he could hear from you for a change. Maybe you don't talk to him enough so he lets the storm come up so he'll hear from you every now and then. The old black preacher said one time, and he said there was a hurricane coming, that big one that we had not too long ago that we did all that improvement down there in North New Orleans. He said, uh, well, preacher, he said, I reckon the Lord heard from a whole lot of people he ain't heard from in a long time when that hurricane came. What was her name? Cat, uh, uh, Katrina. I thought, well, you know what? He's got a point. But you know what sometimes we as Christians do? We just suck it up. We just bow our neck. We just dig in. We just, you know, we're just going to make it work and all that. You know what will happen? The Lord will pass you right by. Yes. Yes. He's still with you. I understand that. You never leave him. I mean, he'll never leave you, never forsake you. But you know what can happen? he just pass you by. Okay, fine. You don't need nothing. You think you got it? Man, I got over that a long time ago. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm past the Samson syndrome. I got it. I got it. I got it. I don't. I mean, I'm weak as a kitten. Lord, help me. I'm bad. You have to pray for her. No matter how sick she is, when I get sick, man, that whole house gets turned upside down. You say, why? Because I'm sick. <laughs> I need special attention. I'm just telling you. You wouldn't want to be in my house then. You say, what are you? I think you're a waiter. Well, then you don't come to my house. When I'm sick, you're the waiter. You the cleaning agent, you the breakfast maker, the lunch maker, the dinner maker, if I feel like eating it, and I might turn up my nose at what you do bring in there. But you're not going to be afraid that you don't hear from me. I'll be ringing that bell or whistling or doing something all the time. Close the door, are you okay? And about the time you get out the door, hey, come back in here. I need some hot tea. My throat's hurting. It's really bothering me. You've got to prop me up a little bit. Okay, bring a teacup in there. You say, I wouldn't do it. Thank God I'm not married to you. No wonder she got sick. Yeah, probably in the reason she got sick. But you ever realize that God puts you in a situation? And sometimes he puts you in that situation because he just wants to hear from you. He just wants to walk with you. He wants to talk with you. And you don't even realize that that situation he puts you in was for your good and for your benefit. Because it's making you cry out and say, God help me. God help me. And you get to learn things about God and trouble that other people don't get the privilege of learning. I mean, you get to learn he is the master of the sea. You get to learn he is the meteorologist in charge of the storm. You get to realize he is the great physician and can walk with you and take care of things other people can't do. He's the best anesthesiologist in the business, man. I mean, you go in there, they tell you start at 100 and count back. You go 100, 90. 
and you're out. You say, why is that? I think it always hits Christians faster than anybody else. You say, man, how come he went to sleep so fast? <laughs> I don't know. The Lord's got him cradled in his arms up there. And the great physician just said, go to sleep now. Let me take care of this. And then he puts on that doctor. He puts on that nurse. And he puts on that anesthesiologist. And he works through every one of them. Oh, preacher, you're just ridiculous. Oh, no, there's enough of him to go around. You trust me when I tell you, man, you go in there. You're not in there before. The Lord's over there at the table. He's looking down. He said, no, no, watch it now. You don't, don't, don't nick that. Move that over there. Move that. Move this. So here, let me hold that out of your way there. Okay, good. Can you see that good enough there? Good again? That good for you there? Okay, good. You know, get that. Pinch that off right there. It's a, there there's the problem right there. Oh, preacher, you don't believe that. Oh, yes, I do believe that. You have put me in the nut house. I believe every bit of what I'm telling you right now. I, honest to God, I believe God's that real. Yeah. And I believe he's that personal. Yes. And I believe that whatever storm you're in, God puts you in that storm yes. and God's able to deliver yes. you out of that storm. Yes. I honestly believe that with all my heart. Well, preacher, what does that mean? Well, some storms last longer than others. Yes. <laughs> and not everybody gets to walk on water. Right. I'm amazed at the ones in the boat. I mean, I, we all talk about Pete walking on the water, and that's a great thing. But you've got to give it to Pete. At least he got out and tried. Yes. What about them other 11 suckers? I mean, the Lord says about the leaping lepers, you know what he said, where's the nine? I wonder when Pete walked up there to him out there and the Lord doesn't after he, you know, Lord saved me, got to kind of looking around, man, I'm walking on water, you know, kind of independent Baptist theology kind of thing, you know, man, look at me, you know, I'm kind of that kind of deal. And all of a sudden, man, he comes back up there and they're starting to walk around. The Lord says, how come them other suckers over there in the boat? Yeah. Yeah, amen. Peter said, I don't know, Lord, but I'm enjoying walking with you. All right. yeah. You find for me one place where anybody else walked on water. What about the 11? Which one would you be? Would you be Peter or one of the 11? Holding on to the thing that's keeping you afloat in the storm? Or would you be willing to turn loose and grab a hold to him? Amen. See, you can't hold the boat and hold on to him. Right. Peter comes out of that boat over there. You say, why did he say? Well, he turned loose of that and the Lord said to him, Peter, that boat, you know, what keeps you floating? Amen. It's me. Peter goes down and the Lord reaches down there and guides him by the hand. It doesn't say how long it is before they come back around. I think they're walking for a while. It'd be how the Lord would do it. I think they're walking in the midst of the storm. Them other boys, the storm's gone. They thought, well, Peter's gone. There must have been a ghost or something. I mean, I think he probably disappeared in the storm. The Lord doesn't say the storm stopped till they got back in the boat. See, there's a purpose for other people being in the storm. Even though you're at peace in the storm, other people are still in the storm. And he's walking around with Peter. About that time, you know, Jaw swims by in the wave like that. And Peter said, man, what is that? And the Lord said, they're going to make a movie about him, you know. Peter's like, man, that's kind of scary. He says, oh, I don't worry about him. I bring him over here and pet him, you know, and that kind of a thing. And he just said, look at that one right there. Eyes out here on either side of his head. He said, what's that? He said, that's a hammerhead. And he looked at Peter. And he looked at the hammerhead and he looked at Peter. Peter said, are you trying to infer? He said, well, <laughs> sometimes, Peter, you kind of remind me of that. I don't know what they talked about. I know this oftentimes in storms, you have conversations with Jesus that he doesn't let everybody else know about. I know that there's times in those storms that he teaches you things. Come on, ma'am, isn't that true? Amen. Got an old uh, ogre for a husband. Don't he minister to you and talk to you and be everything he ain't? Doesn't he talk to you in the storm and doesn't always tell everybody what he says? And he said, now it's between me and you now. Amen. They walk around. I don't know how long they walk around. About that time they get ready to go over there and they get ready to get on the boat. And I think Peter's like a kid. He's gone on his first roller coaster ride, you know. And he's going, can we just go one more time? Can we just go once more? Can I please go one more time? I want to go. Because, you know, once you've done it once, you think, oh, I got it now. I got it. Now I'm good now. Lord, can we just go around one more time? No, Peter, time to get in the boat now. Come on now. And they get in the boat, and boy, all of a sudden, that storm lays down just like that. And the boys say, Peter, what did he say to you? And the Lord said, they'd know if they got out of the boat. They chose not to get out of the boat, Peter. Some things I have to keep between me and those willing to get out of the boat. Oh, come on now, preacher. No, you come on. I think the Lord is still in the personal, individual business. 
I think He knows us. We're feeble and frail as dust. And I think He knows exactly who we are and what we are. And when he, we get out of the boat and come to Him, the Lord said, had a boy. Good job. Proud of you. Appreciate that. Thank you for trusting me. You know, it's a strange thing. Peter doesn't say to the Lord when he said, let me walk on water. He doesn't say, stop the storm. You say, why? Well, later on in life, you know what you'll learn? You'll learn the Lord is in the storm. Yes. He's in the fiery furnace. Yes. He's in the lion's den. He's in the graveyard. Yes. After a while, you know what you'll start learning to do? You'll start learning to embrace those storms. You'll start thinking to yourself, man, the Lord must be taking me somewhere that I wouldn't otherwise go, and He must have something me to do when I get there. Boy, ain't a blessing to be there. The Apostle Paul gets over there in Acts chapter number 16, and he says when he's over there, Paul and Silas have been there. He's been preaching for a while, and he gets over there, and he gets put locked in there. You know what Paul says? One of the strangest things you've ever seen. When Silas says, Paul, this is a terrible thing. This is horrible. This is a bad place to be in. You know what the Apostle Paul said? He said, man, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Amen. He said, I wouldn't be here if he didn't want me to be. He said, man, why don't we sing a song? Sing a song? Man, your back is laid open like a fillet of fish down at McDonald's, man. I mean, you got to be kidding me. You are beat half to death here, Paul. You can't half see in one eye and you're blind in the other one. And you're saying, let's sing it. He goes, man, ain't God good? Ain't this a blessing? Paul, we came over here to answer the Macedonian call in Acts 16. And we're doing exactly what God told us to do. And as soon as we get here and we go to pray, this woman keeps interrupting us and her handler is in the way, has us hung out here and has us thrust into the jail. And Paul said, God's got a strange way of working. We know all things work together for good. And them love God. They're going to be called according to his purpose. And Silas says, Mike, and back, Paul. This isn't what I signed on to. Paul said, well, you hang around with me for a while. I'm troubled on every side. Perplexed, distressed, yes. downtrodden. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, when he runs down through all of those things and nakedness and in peril and in fastings often and in hunger and often and in jail and in prison and of the Jews five times I received 40 stripes, save one. And on all top of all those things, perils of robbers and perils of countrymen and perils of this and perils of that and a day and a night in the deep and on besides all those things, the care of all the churches. Paul said, man, that's my lot in life. You want to hang out with me? He said, what are you going to do? You're going to learn that trouble is a gift. Yes. Trouble is a blessing. Amen. Trouble is an opportunity. You just can't see the eternal reward in it. Amen. If we could see the eternal reward, we'd be more happy about embracing it. Yeah. I know this as sure as I'm standing here this morning as I come to a close. I know as sure as I'm standing here and as sure as the Lord is coming. I know if you live any amount of life whatsoever, it won't be long before trouble is going to come your yes, way. Sir. You say, why? Job says man is born under trouble as the sparks fly upward. The amount of trouble that you have is directly equated to the amount of rewards you want. Rewards don't come easy. You're going to have to earn them. It's more than just witnessing and reading your Bible and praying and coming to church. It's letting the Lord do whatever he Johnny well pleases with you. Yes. Amen. Saying, Lord, I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. You do with me what you want to do with me. And when you surrender to the storm, you not be surprised who shows up in the midst of the storm. Heads are